Uh, so I think as been highlighted by the other speakers this morning, the data for uh, these uh, mechanical support devices and supporting them for cardiogenic shock uh, is virtually non-existent um, in terms of randomized controlled trials. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about troubleshooting tips because I think we can't really move the dial unless we're very good at handling these devices. And a lot of the issues around survival and clinical outcomes hinge upon our ability to manage these pumps. So this field of mechanical circulatory support has been evolving rapidly. This is 10 years of evolution. Uh, those first Thoratec IVADs were when I was an interventional fellow, and that was one of my earliest experiences with mechanical support in the cath lab. Uh, that has now evolved to the HVAD, and now we have the Impella. So these, uh, these continuous flow pumps have now been put onto a catheter, and now for rapid delivery and have been put into the hands of you all as interventionalists, working along with folks like Stavros and cardiac surgeons to make the optimal decisions. And as you can see from the complexity of these cases, we now are beginning to enter a domain of biventricular support that went from tandem and Pella 5.0 now to uh, bipella with using CP and RP as our workhorse platform for a majority of patients with biventricular failure and shock. So my take-home points are going to focus on each of the device uh, platforms, and I'm just going to give you one point. I have seven minutes, so uh, we could spend a whole time or a whole day talking about troubleshooting. But I think it is important to highlight this point, that transvalvular unloading is driven by RPMs and a transvalvular pump gradient. You've heard me say this before, but this concept of the HQ curve, I think, is a fundamental one. It explains why we use uh, technologies like Impella uh, for cardiogenic shock or for high-risk PCI and why these devices are optimally suited because the more dysfunctional the ventricle, the lower the pressure gradient across the aortic valve, the more functional these pumps become. And so that's a fundamental hydraulic principle that any engineer will tell you and that uh, they would be agnostic to the clinical uh, scenario that you're dealing with. But I do think it's important also to highlight that there are things that we need to troubleshoot with Impella. So I was at the Asayo meeting uh, a couple months ago in Chicago and uh, I was giving a talk and uh, one of the uh, audience members raised their hand and said, every time I put an Impella, I get 100% of my patients get hemolysis. And I said, okay, um, that's unique, hopefully. And I tried to understand exactly what the operator was doing and what his team was doing in terms of managing the impella to get 100% hemolysis in every patient they're implanting. So one of the important things for troubleshooting with impella is you do have to monitor for hemolysis, especially if you're going to be using the device for cardiogenic shock, which usually requires days of support, not three to four hours during a high-risk PCI, et cetera. So if we think about the primary determinants of, of hemolysis, this blood damage occurs primarily because of device speed. So that's an RPM that you dial in. It's also built upon scalar stress, so the shear stress that occurs along those impeller blades. And then, of course, the exposure time to the shear stress. So how long are the blades? Are they short? Are they long? You know, exactly what is the exposure time of the red blood cell uh, to that uh, blade itself? And then, of course, looking for inlet and outflow obstruction. That gets, that gets into positioning of the devices themselves. But it is also important to note that if you talk to folks like Stavros and the heart failure team, for surgical ambulatory LVADs, the determination for hemolysis is driven by an L of DH level. And so an LDH is a marker of hemolysis for an ambulatory person 72 hours after LVAD. The problem is that in cardiogenic shock, the cutoff for hemolysis is an LVAD. It's about 550. And the majority of patients in cardiogenic shock come in with massive elevations in LDH. So we can't really use LDH to determine whether or not someone's developing hemolysis in cardiogenic shock. So the other metric is to use something called a plasma-free hemoglobin. So normally there shouldn't be hemoglobin in our plasma. But if you identify that there is hemoglobin, that's usually leaked from sheared red blood cells. And so in patients who do not have clinical hemolysis, meaning hemoglobinuria, AKI, et cetera, we see hemoglobin levels below 20 and certainly below 40. In the patients who develop clinical hemolysis, this hemoglobin level is above 40. So it's important to track a plasma from hemoglobin, not just the LDH in isolation, which your heart failure teams may be telling you. It's also important to remember that with the 5.0 device, hemolysis is virtually non-existent. It's very rare with the 5.0, primarily because of the size of the caliber of the impeller itself. But with the CP, you do have to watch for it. So you can see here the LDH levels are all elevated, and we don't see much change over time with the LDHs. But in the plasma-free group, you can start to see there are some changes, and you have to respond to these changes by making some adjustments. So that means optimizing your device position. It means using the lowest RPM setting required. So unlike high-risk PCI, where we put patients on P8 or P9 or auto mode and you let the, do the PCI, here you may only require P6 and a low-dose inotrope, and you'll actually be able to avoid a lot of hemolysis. 
And then also checking the plasma for hemoglobin in LDHQ 12 hours uh, for 72 hours is our protocol for all AMCS devices at our institution. So the next device is the tandem heart device. So this is a left atrial ephemeral artery bypass pump. It's um, not commonly used in our institution anymore, but this was our workhorse platform for many years, so we have a lot of experience with it. And this device focuses primarily on LV preload reduction as opposed to transvalvular pumping from the LV to the AO. And one of the things for troubleshooting with this device is the left atrial cannula sits in the left atrium, and as a result, you can actually get suction and you can get migration. So this is a patient who had a, a tandem put in in our institution at 3,500 RPMs. You ramp up to 6,800 RPMs, and you see there's complete suck down of the left atrial wall around the inlet flow of the cannula. And so the issue was with the tandem was that you were limited by the volume in the left atrium. So if you had a normal left atrium, you couldn't really ramp up to the maximum flow you needed because you would get suction on the inflow cannula and you'd get chatter. And so to avoid LA suction, and actually what would happen is this uh, suction, if you left it that way, would slowly push the cannula back across into the right atrium. And if that's happening, now you're going to take venous blood and shunt it into the arterial system if you're not watching for this effect of suction and migration. So to avoid suction and migration, you've got to restrict patient movement. You've got to look for venous pulsing in the arterial cannula. And you've got to maintain adequate device preload, so basically a wedge pressure of 10 to 15. And again, using the optimal RPM that's required for your patient. But this was one of the major limitations we had with um, not being able to achieve the highest maximum flow with a tandem device as determined by the left atrium. So the next platform is VA ECMO. So this is a slide that I tend to show to illustrate in the cath lab what happens when you activate VA ECMO and the loading effect where you see that the LV pressures start to climb and you start to see a narrow pulse pressure. And what I've had is operators tell me, well, I've put the VA ECMO in and the pulse pressure went to minimal pulsatility, so we're unloading. And it turns out that actually you're doing the exact opposite of unloading. So when we put the impel in and you see a minimal pulse amplitude, that's because the pump's taking over the left ventricle. In this case, when you start to see that minimal pulse amplitude, this is because you're actually loading the aortic root. And so the LV can't eject against that load effectively. And so when you see this, uh, and to prove it to yourself, you put an LV catheter in, and you can see this massively elevated LV peak pressure matching to the aortic pressure, even though there's a narrow pulse pressure. So that's actually an indicator of load as opposed to unloading. And so, of course, one of the worst examples of troubleshooting with a VA ECMO, and we always try to avoid, is acute pulmonary congestion. So this was probably the most dramatic case uh, that I have in my records of a patient coming in, biventricular failure, myocarditis, crash and burn, intermax one shock, and a 25-year-old. And you can see here we're on multiple pressures. This is the arterial pressure. This is the PA pressure. We activate VA ECMO in the cath lab, and there's that immediate jump in the, in the arterial pressure, and that's what everyone gets a sigh of relief at that point. But what we started to notice was that the PA pressure within 10 minutes had jumped up, and this is the highest PA pressure that you hopefully will never encounter is a PA pressure of 100 acutely. And also, we actually thought at this point that the transducer had fallen on the floor and that there was some artifact, but actually when we put in our Langston into the LV, the LVEDP was matching the aortic diastolic pressure. And there was not really any AI here, which is, of course, the first thing we would think of. And if you look closely at the tracing, it doesn't fit with an AI-type tracing. And so the treatment here was to immediately put in a CP, and immediately the PA pressure is decongested right away as soon as you start to vent. So this is not likely to happen in your scenarios, but the key thing is to watch for pulmonary congestion and that LV loading effect of VA ECMO. You can't ignore that. And so you can actually see this because a lot of our intensivists are very focused on ECMO and they didn't believe in the concept of ECPELA, so we proved it to them by basically just doing an echo on one of our patients. This is with the impella in on someone who has VA ECMO. We simply pulled the impella back out with just the pigtail across the LV, and you can start to see the LV is already distended with VA ECMO without the CP in place. And so that's the idea of using the uh, LV uh, venting system with an impella device. So the final thing for all of the devices is to troubleshoot is to monitor and prevent limb ischemia. So if you're going to put in mechanical support devices, you've got to get really good at anti-grade perfusion. So this actually was a uh, crash and burn case. This was a 13-year-old uh, who, uh, unfortunately, my pediatric college dragged me in there. And I have an 11-year-old, so this was not fun. But this was basically putting this uh, in bedside in a 13-year-old girl, basically who's crashing burning on ECMO. And, she had, you know, the vascular, vasculature is obviously much smaller, so we had to basically bring her to the cath lab. And she needed an event immediately because her LVDP started to go up to about 40, 50 range. And so here we actually have the integrated perfusion sheath. I use a six French braided sheath to avoid any kinking on both sides. And then this is the Impella CP. This is our cordis for hemodynamic monitoring. 17 French arterial in a 13-year-old. She was a pretty big kid. Uh, and a 25 French multistage venous. But the key thing here is that without these anti-grade perfusion sheaths, she's going to lose a leg. 
And if you're 13 years old, I mean, this is devastating. So the idea here was to basically immediately go on to uh, bifemoral uh, bypass using a three-way stopcock and then allowing using these uh, male-to-male connectors to get bilateral perfusion. She actually did very well. She was a crash and burn myocarditis case. She's now decannulated and uh, sitting there uh, with her mocha chino yelling at her mom. Um, so the other thing is to think about percutaneous axillary and brachial. You'll hear hopefully more about this over the meeting. This is our setup for this approach. Uh, the key things with this technique, I always use a purse string suture, and I tend to do this actually more in the brachial position than in the axillary, so about two or three centimeters away from uh, the um, pectoral groove here in the arm. And then once the device is in place, and this is actually just deployment through the axillary approach, we're doing this more and more these days, and this is a very nice way of avoiding any of the limb ischemia um, issues that you might come across. So uh, thanks very much for your attention for troubleshooting.